It's October the 2nd. Let's read the Bible. Friends, welcome back. Here we are from Genesis to Revelation in just one year. What a joy it is to be with you um, here on the Bible bus. You know, some of you listen to, many of you, I'm sure listen to Dr. J. Vernon McGee through the Bible. Number one Bible teacher in the world. He's been in heaven for many, many, many years. I still think he is. Uh, I think his programs and all the different translate and all the different translated versions. I think it's the most listened to Christian program in the world. He's the man who, at least to my knowledge, first came up with the idea of get on the Bible bus, and we're just we're just borrowing that because it helps us understand what we're doing. It and I mention that because I I got a note here from somebody who said because. I'll say, hop on the Bible bus. Let's read it together. Somebody said, can we pretend we're on a double-decker Bible bus? That makes it sound like extra fun. Well, you know, a double-decker Bible bus would be fun. In fact, a few years ago, uh, my brothers, we were having a, a, a family reunion, uh, and we were, uh, <laughs> my mind's going a little crazy here, but we were with Andy, me, Ray, Alan, my brother Ron, and then some other cousins. We were there uh, with the family. Of course, Marlene was with me, and uh, we were there for this cousin's reunion outside of Oxford, Mississippi, and we took a we took a double-decker bus tour through uh, downtown Oxford, Mississippi, and our guide was a, a man who, a raconteur, with brilliant stories about the history of Oxford and North Mississippi and how the Pritchard family fit into all of that. It was fascinating. I loved the idea of being on a double-decker bus. And just when the Oxford thing just popped into my mind when I read that comment. But you know, there's so many people. If we had a double-decker bus, we'd have to have a really, 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 really long one for all the people who are watching these videos. Hey, we're just glad you are here. Now, Now today, we're coming to a really important turning point because uh, we're, we're about to start uh, chapter 34, which means we have finished one half of the book of Isaiah. And we're going to do chapters 34 and 35 and 36. 34 and 35 have to do with, I believe, that they are prophecies from Isaiah about the Battle of Armageddon, the coming millennial kingdom, but we're going to get into chapter 36, and I've simply called that a historical interlude. And let me just say this. I'll say more about this tomorrow, but chapters 36, 37, 38, and 39, they are actually repeated. Maybe that's not exactly the right word, but you can buy the same historical story about Hezekiah told in Second Kings and also told in Second Chronicles. So it's told this same amazing story about Hezekiah and the, Assyri the attempted Assyrian invasion of Judah in about 701 B.C. told three different times, because it's really about how God miraculously intervened to deliver his people. So we're going to get the beginning of that in chapter 36 today. So let's begin to read. Lord, open, we pray, the eyes of our heart. Help us to see wonderful things, wonderful things, from your word. Isaiah 34, the judgment of the nations, I believe, describing events at the end of the tribulation period. You nations, come here and listen. You peoples, pay attention. Let the earth and all that fills it hear, the world and all that comes from it. The Lord is angry with all the nations, furious with all their armies. He will set them apart for destruction, giving them over to slaughter. The slain will be thrown out and the stench of their corpses will rise the mountains will flow with their blood. That sounds a lot like Revelation 19. All the stars in the sky will dissolve. The sky will roll up like a scroll, and the stars and its stars will all wither as leaves wither on the vine and foliage on the fig tree. When my sword has drunk its fill in the heavens, it will then come down on Edom and on the people I have set apart for destructions. Destruction. The Lord's sword is covered with blood. It drips with fat, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra, a great slaughter in the land of Edom. 
The wild oxen will be struck down with them, and young bulls with the mighty bulls. Their land will be soaked with blood, and their soil will be saturated with fat. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a time of paying back Edom for its hostility against Zion. Edom's streams will be turned into pitch, her soil into sulfur. Her land will become burning pitch. It will never go out day or night. Its smoke will go up forever. This part, by the way, sounds a lot like Revelation 14. It will be desolate from generation to generation. No one will pass through it forever and ever. Eagle owls and herons will possess it, and long-eared owls and ravens will dwell there. The Lord will stretch out a measuring light and a plumb light over her for her destruction and chaos. No nobles will be left to proclaim a king, and all her princes will come to nothing. Her palaces will be overgrown with thorns, her fortified cities with thistles and briars. She will become a dwelling for jackals and abode for ostriches. The desert creatures will meet hyenas, and one wild goat will call to another. Indeed, the night birds will stay there and fi will find a resting place. Sand partridges will make their nests there. They will lay and hatch their eggs and will gather their broods under, the, under the sh their shadows. Indeed, the birds of prey will gather there, each with its mate. Search and read the scroll of the Lord. Not one of them will be missing. None will be lacking its mate, because he has ordered it by my mouth, and he will gather them by his spirit. He has cast a lot for them. His hand allotted their portion with a measuring line. They will possess it forever. They will dwell in it from generation to generation. This is a fearful judgment, friends, a fearful judgment on the whole earth. And the birds of the prey gathering there is reminiscent of some of the things in Ezekiel 37, 38, and into 39. And it's very reminiscent of what we find in Revelation 14 and what we find in Revelation 19. Now, chapter 35, some good news. The wilderness and the dry land will be glad. The desert will rejoice and become like a wildflower. It will re blossom abundantly and also rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord. The splendor of our God, strengthen the weak hands, steady the shaking knees. Hebrews 12, say to the cowardly, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. Vengeance is coming. God's retribution is coming. He will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. For water will gush in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched ground will become a pool and the thirsty land springs in the haunt of jackals in their lairs, there will be grass, wheat, reeds, and papyrus. A road will be there and a way. It will be called the holy way. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be there for the one who walks the path. Fools will not wander on it. There will be no lion there, and no vicious beast will go up on it. They will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk on it, and the ransomed of the Lord will return and come to Zion with singing crowned with unending joy, joy and gladness will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee. Parts of this sound like Revelation 20 and 21. So what you have in chapter 34, fearsome, fearsome images of judgment of the birds gathering over the corpses of the dead. Uh, yeah, Jesus talked about this. You can find this in the odd parts of this in the Olivet Discourse, but you can find it in the book of Revelation too. So I'm just saying the Bible is repeating down the down the line, it's repeating. This is really going to happen now. Chapter 36, beginning of that interlude, the year 701 BC, and a fellow by the name of Sennacherib, the Assyrian leader, his mighty vast army has come to the gates of Jerusalem. It's a hopeless situation. It's uh, this, 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 there's Judah has no hope, no hope. Northern 10 tribes are gone. They've been gone for about 21 years now. It's just Judah. And here come the Assyrians. It's impossible for them to win. This story is told, 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, and here in Isaiah 36, 37, 38, and 39. In other words, this is so important. It's told three times in the Old Testament. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, 
King Sennacherib of Assyria attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. Then the king of Assyria sent his royal spokesman, along with a massive army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. The Assyrians stood near the conduit of the upper pool by the road to Longerer's Field. Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, who was in charge of the palace, Shebna, the court secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the court historia, historian, came out to him. They came out representing King Hezekiah. So you got Eliakim, Shebna, and Zo and Joah. The royal spokesman said to them, this is the Assyrians' spokesman now, said, tell Hezekiah, the great king, the king of Assyria, says this, what are you relying on? You think mere words are strategy and strength for war. Who are you now relying on that you've rebelled against me? Look, you are relying on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff that will pierce the hand of anyone who grabs it and leans on it. This is how Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is to all who rely on him. Suppose you say to me, we rely on the Lord our God. Isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you are to worship at this altar? Now, make a deal with my master, the king of Assyria. I'll give you 2,000 horses if you're able to supply riders for them. That was kind of a smart alecky comment. How then can you drive back a single officer among the least of my master's servants? How can you rely on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? That's a good question. You got the pagans here, the Assyrians, saying to King Hezekiah, look at my mighty army. You think Egypt's going to save you? Well, he was right about that. Have I attacked this land to destroy it without the Lord's approval? The Lord said to me, attack this land and destroy it. That was an arrogant thing. For Sennacherib to say, then Eliakim, Shebna, and, jo and Joah said to the royal spokesman, please speak to your servants in Aramaic since we understand it. Don't speak to us in Hebrew within earshot of the people who are on the wall. But the royal spokesman replied, has my master sent me to speak these words to, to your master and to you and not to the men who are sitting on the wall who were destined with you to eat their own excrement and drink their own urine? It's kind of smart. He wants to make sure the wants to make sure the Jewish soldiers on the wall, he wants them to hear the threats. They know how vast the Assyrian army is. They're, they know there's no way they can beat them. Huh. He, wants them to, he wants the Jewish soldiers to know you're going to eat your own dung and drink your own urine. Then the royal spokesman stood and called out loudly in Hebrew, listen to the words of the great king of Assyria. This is what the king says, don't let Hezekiah deceive you, for he cannot rescue you. Don't let Hezekiah persuade you to rely on the Lord, saying, The Lord will certainly rescue us. This city will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. Go listen to Hezekiah, for this is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and surrender to me, that every one of you may eat from his own vine and his own fig tree and drink water from his own sister until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyard. Vineyards, beware that Hezekiah does not mislead you by saying, the Lord will rescue us. Has any one of the gods of the nations rescued his land from the power of the king of Assyria? I stop to say the answer is no. Pretty much on an undefeated winning streak here. So the point is well taken. These lesser nations, they can't stand against Assyria. What makes you think you use? What makes you think your God can defeat me? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpach? Where are the gods of the Sepharvaim? Have they rescued Samaria from my power? Who among all the gods of these lands ever rescued his land from my power? So will the Lord rescue Jerusalem from my power? That's the question, isn't it? It's a good question. But they, keep, but they kept silent. They didn't say anything. For the king's command was, don't answer him. Don't get into a food fight. Don't get into a shouting match with the Assyrians. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, who was in charge of the palace, Shebna, the court secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the court historian, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and reported to him the words of the royal spokesman. We're going to stop right there. I think it was uh, Erwin Lutzer who said, only desperate people learn to pray. My friend, Dr. Lutzer, is exactly right. Hmm. When things are going good, we don't ever pray. Oh, we do, but we don't pray. You know, you, you learn how to pray at midnight. You uh, 
I've told people before that the effective fervent, the fervent prayer of a righteous man, that word for fervent there in James 5 means boiling. Well, if this word, it's energetic, it can mean boiling. Boiling prayers get God's attention. What's a boiling prayer? If you're a, a grandparent, like I, well, like what I am, or if you're a mom or dad, if you're a parent like I am, and you got a little four-year-old daughter, and the doctors say she's got a heart defect, and we gotta give her surgery, and it's dangerous, but it's the only hope of saving her life. Let me tell you something. When they wheel that little girl away, they take her away, and with tears in your eyes, you see her being taken away, you will pray a boiling prayer, and no one's going to have to tell you to do it. You may not even open your mouth, but from your heart in desperation, you will cry out to God. It is a good thing to be brought to the place of utter desperation because that's when we find out what God can do. Only desperate people learn to pray. So do not, do not, I, I don't think we should ask God for desperate times. So don't have to worry about that. God will send them when we really need them. But don't despise the desperate times because anything that drives us to our knees is for our own good. So Lord, teach us to trust in you today, tomorrow, in every day. Got to come back tomorrow. Go out and have a great day. Trust in the Lord today. Don't be afraid. And don't apologize for desperation. Just cry out to God. Have a great day, folks. We gotta, you got to come back tomorrow. We got to find out what's going to happen. What's going to happen now? Have a great day. Come back tomorrow. We'll do this again.